to celebrate the arrival of this terrific new book that so many of you have contributed to. So we're grateful to Victor Paul and the University of Helsinki for their efforts to organize the environmental humanities, not one month, but two months, it turns out. And um, this seems to be a very appropriate occasion for us to have a virtual book launch for this um, multi-participant project, the Bloomsbury Handbook to the Medical Environmental Humanities. <clears throat> And I, I just wanted to open things by saying a few words before handing the mic over to my colleagues, friends, and co-editors, uh, Swarnalata Rangaranjan and Vidya Sarveswaran. Um, and um, in addition to that, would like to create a space at the beginning for our, our friend Ben Doyle from Bloomsbury Academic to say a few words about Bloomsbury and this particular project, and then, um, allow each of you to uh, say a little bit about your particular chapters uh, for this project. So it was about three years ago that Swarna and Vidya contacted me and suggested that we consider compiling a book that would bring together these two vibrant fields, the medical humanities and the environmental humanities. And working with 30 contributors from countries throughout the world, we've tried to cover such wide, wide ranging topics as eco narratology and narrative medicine, graphic medicine as a lens through which to read environmental texts, the history of virology, gray ecology, eco psychology, environmental toxicity and public health, and a variety of additional topics and specific visions of the interrelationships between human health and the more than human environment from cultures in South America, South Asia, Latin America, West Africa, East Asia, Turkey, and Ireland. As we state in the book's introduction, this collection explores the shared precarity, the vulnerability of human and non-human life on the earth. The essays in this book shed light on the ways in which literature and other cultural texts address our understanding of human minds and bodies within the context of the physical environment. In addition to the obvious physical aspects of disease and contamination, in the 21st century, we must learn to understand the mental health implications of climate change, the anxiety caused by increasingly toxic environmental conditions and the overarching challenges um, of facing vast slow processes that jeopardize not only the more than human world, but our own safety. The chapters in this book aim to reveal our ecological predicament as a simultaneous threat to human health. So uh, we have at this point, maybe a little bit less than one hour today, um, but maybe we can spill over slightly because of our earlier interruption. And um, so we have with us, I think at this point, mostly contributors to the book, maybe a few additional uh, friends, colleagues, and students. And um, as I said, uh, each of you who've been involved in the project will have a chance to say a little bit about your chapter, and I'll attempt to guide us around the virtual room to um, in, in some semblance of order. Um, but as I said, we're also very pleased uh, to welcome the uh, Ben Doyle, who's the publisher for Literature, Digital Cultures, and Medical Health Humanities for Bloomsbury Academic, and Ben will also participate. Um, so right now, I'd like to invite my co-editors, uh, Swarna Rangarajan and Vidya Sarveswaran, to each address the group for a few minutes followed by Ben Doyle, and then we'll turn to the other contributors to the project. So let me, at this point, hand the mic over to Swarna and then from her to Vidya. Swarna? Uh, thanks, Scott. So uh, a very warm welcome to everybody attending this event. Uh, I'm Swarna Latarandaraja, it's a very long name, so uh, Swarna. And um, I hail from India, the southern part of India, a state called Tamar Nadu. And I'm delighted to be here today, I'm grateful to Victor and the University of Helsinki for organizing this event for all of us. As Scott mentioned, um, the idea of this book germinated before um, COVID struck. 
In fact, it for me it germinated in grief during the summer of 2019. And I wrote the concept note in the days following my father's death, which was a long and cruel battle with Parkinson's disease for over a decade. And uh, this book is catalyzed by my own challenges as a primary caregiver. I had to constantly balance and adapt to the new challenges that my father's progressive neurogenerative disorder brought. Um, it was at this time that a line from Theodore Rathke's wonderful poem called out to me. I quote just one line, I think of the turtle gasping in the, du the dusty rubble of the highway. Um, this line had a special resonance for me because I kind of recall the countdown moments of my father's life, making multiple material connections between my father's oxygen starved body and those of countless others who literally gasped to death during the first and second waves of COVID-19. So the image of the gasping turtle throws up a whole host of hypoxia narratives. My father's lungs gurgling with the slowly filling fluid. Um, and this image converges with more sinister news stories of oxygen starved COVID patients being driven around for hours in ambulances without hope of finding a hospital bed or even temporary oxygen support. A scene that replayed itself in most Indian cities during the peak of the second wave in 2021. Um, although this handbook was conceived of in the pre-COVID days, I think the core ideas that went into the CFP ended up being prophetic about the challenges that the pandemic would throw at the world in the months to come. Well, our objective was to engage with literary imaginaries centering around categories such as body, physicality, mind, emotions, dealing with the themes of disease, dis treatment, uh, recovery. And my own reading about Parkinson's specific research to understand what causes the disease revealed a strong link uh, that had been established between Parkinson's and exposure to pesticides and herbicides. Um, the greatest offender in the list is perhaps paraquat dichloride, a common herbicide that has been banned in 32 countries and also in Kerala, India, which is my neighboring state. So despite its toxicity, paraquat was being used in most states in India on 25 cash crops in violation of the directive of the Central Insecticide Board and Registration Committee, which has approved its use in only nine crops. So I wondered what genetic predisposition and my father called out to the deadly toxin that must have insidiously percolated into a system to the vegetables we buy from Koyambedu, which is Chennai's biggest wholesale vegetable market, also one of the largest perishable markets in Asia with supplies coming in from all parts of the country. Well, suddenly it all came together, the pervasive slow violence that Rob Nixon talks of, um, Scott, and, uh, Scott and Paul Slovic in their books, Numbers and Nerves. Um, that book helped me understand the power of narratives in deepening our cognitive responses to the deluge of statistical data in which we are always afloat. And my father's disease also prompted me to explore how environmental damage is mapped onto the porous human body. Uh, landmark books like Disability Studies and the Environmental Humanities Sorry. by Sarah Jack Retrain uh, and, and, uh, and uh, Jay Sibara pointed to the intersectional resonances between eco-criticism and disability studies, introducing me to a somatic paradigm of ecological thinking. Well, I came to understand and value the importance of the materialistic politics of care advocated by writer activist Ellie Clare, who says, you know, it's important how do we witness, maim, and resist the injustices that reshape and damage all kinds of bodies, plant and animal, organic and inorganic, non-human and human? And how do we make peace with the reshaped and damaged bodies themselves, cultivate love and respect for them? So that's what the book has been, a personal journey and also a journey of interbeing with the 28 wonderful authors who helped us out. There were deaths to mourn, illnesses to grapple with, the book took three long years in the making with multiple rounds of soliciting because of COVID impediments. But when I look back and marvel at the organic evolution of the book's idea, I realized that the process was perhaps as precious as this perfect culmination point. 
the book whose release we are celebrating today. Thank you so much. Um, I now request Vidya to say a few words about the book. Vidya. Thank you so much, uh, Scott and Swarna, and everybody uh, here. It's been a pleasure uh, to work with all of you on this journey. As I said earlier, it's great to see faces. I mean, after all the communication that we've had. Uh, so I'll quickly say a little bit about uh, my chapter, since both Scott and Swarna have spoken about the inception of the book. Uh, so the, the chapter, the epilogue that I chose to write is titled Dying to Breathe fear as a comorbidity in the desert. So uh, I am basically from the southern part of India, very similar to where, uh, you know, the, the same uh, town is where Swarna is from, which is called Chennai on Madras. But then I live, my work takes me to a place called Jodhpur, which is in the northwest of India, which is uh, a desert. And this is the only desert in India, which is called the Thar Desert. So uh, the place where I hail from, uh, but the place of my birth is a seashore. And then the sudden dramatic transformation of having to live uh, in a desert for the last 11 years uh, has been quite uh, a, a very, uh, you know, both personally and uh, professionally, uh, very powerful uh, for me, for somebody who's never seen uh, the desert. So, and, and one thing about the desert is, this particular desert is dust. So dust becomes the lay motive of the essay and also my personal uh, life. You know, the more you sweep, there are dust storms and the more you clean, it's like a palimpsest, layers and layers of dust storms. And then it's, it's very hard to get rid of the, of the dust. So I've chosen, a, I, the whole thing is about, it's a personal narrative that I've chosen to actually write because I'm also allergic to dust. And then it becomes difficult to breathe when you're allergic to dust. And during the COVID, COVID first and the second phase, I lived alone and I had to stay alone uh, on campus because my family lives in the south of India. And uh, when you get breathless, you're not sure whether it's because of the dust or whether it's because of COVID. So fear is a comorbidity more than the disease itself. So the idea of disease and disease by itself. So those are the kind of conflicts that I faced uh, when I was all by myself trying to handle both the waves uh, of uh, COVID. So the, the whole essay is about uh, fear. I'll quickly read a couple of passages uh, from the essay uh, with your permission. As with most schools around the world, we have switched to digital pedagogies. I zoom in and my equally burnt out students zoom out. I miss the garrulous millennials and precocious physical classroom conversations. I miss my morning cycle rides and cafeteria hangouts with students and friends. I simply miss the sound of another voice and footfall in my oversized apartment. The Australian environmental philosopher Glenn Albert employed the term solastalgia in 2015 to describe the lived experience of distressing negative environmental change, particularly when the environment is one that the sufferer has inhabited. But in my case, instantaneous transmogrification of the cultural environment has thrown me off my familiar campus cultural environmental map. I desperately try to negotiate the new cartographies without a rudder. This pandemic is a psychoterratic game changer. The isolation, disease, despair, loneliness are like tenuous spider webs in your head. I'm so homesick at home. I struggle to maintain my equanimity in these transformed spaces. So this is about the pandemic, but a serious issue in Rajasthan, in the Thar Desert is particularly, is an occupational hazard, a disease that arises out of the dust, which is called silicosis. So silicosis is, uh, connected to marble mine, the marble mining industry in Rajasthan. And 90% of the world's, uh, one third of the uh, world's marble and 90% of India's marble, beautiful monuments that we see, comes from Rajasthan, white marble and pink uh, sandstone. But then the number of people who breathe in the dust and then their lungs are affected. So there's very, you know, very uh, minute distinction between tuberculosis, silicosis, and then we've had uh, COVID. I have a karmic connection with deserts all over the world. Several years ago, I lived in the United States as a Fulbright Fellow in the University of Nevada, Reno, to pursue my doctoral research on Terry Tempest Williams. I also had the privilege of spending a few days with Terry in Salt Lake City, Utah, the Mojave, the Sonoran, and the Great Basin Deserts. They've all been home to me at some point in time. But the Taj is unique for its dust. I dread the dust in the desert. I'm not just allergic to it. But the, but the dust here is singular. 
aeolian and fugitive, as environmentalists would say. Dust is like a palimpsest in my house. I sweep, swab, wipe, and Lysol mop, but the desert insists on returning it back. Every layer is a new story. Dust in this desert forms my karmic patterns as it does for many others who live here. I'm distracted by a sudden phone call. It's my maid. It's, it's common to hire maids uh, in India. There is an ominous pause on the other hand, on the other side, and she says, nothing. And I say, COVID? No, it's my husband. He's passed on. It's the dust disease. A small, a small muffled voice announces. I knew that she means silicosis. Years of inhaling silica crystals due to drilling and hammering scar the lung tissues. Victims die of hardened lungs and an inability to breathe. The disease is declared an endemic in the state. I have seen the mines as a, as a documentary filmmaker. I've also had the opportunity to work or to make a little, a small or short film on the mining, on mining in Rajasthan. And I've, I've witnessed the mines. I've actually seen the mines. They're very dramatic. They're very graphic. The mining quarries look like anything from nuclear bomb craters to giant crop circles or meteor impacted terrains. Ironically, some of the world's most beautiful monuments that are built from white marble and pink sandstone find their way from the recesses of this fragile earth in this region. The, the earth here wears the badge of blood, disease, and death. We have failed as a human race. So that's, that, that's how I feel about dust, silicosis, breathing, the ability or the inability to breathe. So that's why I've called it dying to breathe. You know, and the state does have a few policies that it's come up with, but it's not really implemented, you know, in that sense, because it's also, we must remember that, uh, you know, this is a voice from the global south. So it's, it's very different. Uh, it would be very different, perhaps, in another uh, scenario. So that's just a part of my uh, epilogue. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Vidya. And both the piece that Swarna was talking out of and what Vidya was reading from are in the epilogue to the book. Thank you both very much. Um, why don't we move on and, and let Ben say a few words from his perspective as the uh, representative of the publisher regarding this project and maybe maybe Bloomsbury's interest in this sort of work. Thank you, Ben. Yeah, absolutely. And um, thanks so much to um, University of Helsinki for organizing this and bringing everyone together. It's really lovely to see um, familiar faces and new faces um, all in one place. Uh, so first of all, I wanted to say um, how proud I am to have been a part of publishing the book on um, Bloomsbury's list. Um, human health and the environments in which we live are obviously two of the day's most urgent concerns. Um, and the essays represented in this book um, are the first kind of sustained attempt to bring together environmental humanities and the medical humanities and bring them into conversation uh, to shed more light on the relationship between the environmental crisis through which we're living and human health. Um, and I really think that the volume's contribution is demonstrated by the hugely flattering endorsements given to the book um, by some of the by some of the sort of foremost scholars working in these fields, all of which were a real um, testament to both the editors and the contributors, really, really hard work, um, their dedication and intellectual prowess. So I wanted to say first off a huge thank you to everyone involved in putting the volume together. Um, I think it's representative of what interdisciplinary humanities research can, can really contribute at its best. Um, and it's a real testament to a truly kind of collaborative ethos that's often found, I think, amongst humanities scholars, but also not remarked upon often enough. Um, seeing such an international range of contributions brought together um, under the banner of the medical environmental humanities is really something that's, that's brilliant to see. Um, and it's a true example of the inclusive, collaborative way in which we should be addressing um, topics like this, which stretch across the world and impact us all. Um, so again, huge thanks from all of us at Bloomsbury um, to Vidya, Swana and Scott, um, to all of the contributors. It's been a massive pleasure to work with you all. Um, and it's really lovely, as I said before, to have the occasion to kind of get together and celebrate the launch to kind of round everything off. Um, so. Thanks again, and um, lovely to see you all. Thank, thank you very much, Ben. Um, yeah, and uh, if this were a really proper launch, we would be toasting the book. So we <laughs> should probably, with our tea or our coffee or whatever, just say cheers and, and congratulations to everyone. And thank you. Yeah. 
Um, so at this point, let me also uh, let me um, initiate movement around the virtual room and let each of you say a little bit about your projects. I realize I didn't identify myself geographically in a proper way. I'm I'm from the University of Idaho, but I live in Oregon. I'm in the state of Oregon and in the city of Eugene, which is much like Ireland, Tess, very green, very wet, although we've had a drought, but it's been raining lately. So we're really delighted to be looking more and more like Ireland right now. Um, and kind of the temperate rainforest is what they call this part of the world. Um, so happy to be interacting with all of you from from my location here in the American West. I see next to me on the screen, um, Nicoletta Zampaki from Greece. And Nicoletta, maybe you can get us started by telling us a little bit about your contribution to the book. Yes, great. Uh, I'm located in Athens in Greece. So hello from Greece, from sunny Athens. Uh, dear Scott, Swarna, and Vaidia, dear colleagues uh, from across the globe, uh, I'm really excited to be here with all of you today. First of all, I want to start by warmly thanking SWOT, uh, Swarna and Vidia for our excellent collaboration a deep friendship. Bloomsbury's publisher, Mr. Ben Doyle, and congratulating all the contributors for this thought-provoking edition on the fields of environmental humanities and medical humanities. Actually, uh, it was uh, a journey for me because uh, I have written this chapter as PhD candidate. Now I'm a doctor in modern Greek uh, literature. I had defended my PhD thesis, many, many thanks. And uh, I couldn't have done it without uh, all of your support, uh, dear Scott, uh, Swarna and Vidia. And of course, uh, my uh, supervisor, Professor Carpuzo's fruitful research discussions on the topic of metabolic poetics and art in the age of Anthropocene, uh, studying uh, Maurice Merlopoty's uh, later ontology in order to lay the ground on the concept of post-human aesthetics. Uh, actually, the aim of my chapter is to analyze and examine Maurice Merleau-Ponty's concepts of flesh of the world, uh, la chair, uh, universal flesh, and chiasma uh, that are adapted in Adam Dickinson's uh, sample of poems of the poetic collection entitled The Anatomic, and uh, Pina Yorda's uh, artistic project entitled The Ecosystem of Excess, and propose a new reading of these works through a posthuman aesthetic perspective. Uh, Merleau-Ponty's uh, formation concepts are the main axis in order to interpret nature and body by addressing an embodied and lived experience in space. Uh, directed uh, by this concept, uh, Dickinson's metabolic poetics intersects the field of core competitiveness by imaging other worlds and possibilities of existence. And moving from poetics to art, uh, I examine uh, the universal flesh's plasticity in Yolda's uh, formation projects uh, where the organic and inorganic life forms are in constant interplay. Uh, so uh, through a post-human aesthetic perspective, uh, this universal flesh, the Merleau-Pontian concept, remaps and renews our reality in which all the processes and transformations of human nature and body are in symbiotic relationship in both bio and techno artistic spheres. Again, my thanks and gratitude, my pleasure to work with you and think together for the future of our ecos, a Greek term, as you know, in a more than human world. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Nicoletta, for that very uh, clear and succinct summary of your chapter. That was very nice. Um, uh, Tess, maybe we can move on to you. Okay. Um, well, uh, as you can see, I'm not in the kitchen anymore. I'm, I'm at the, they might say, at the west side of the house, so you can see the sun setting behind me here. And I just thought it was appropriate to be as close uh, to nature as I could get. Uh, you may hear a dog barking, uh, and that's all part of the kind of authenticity of where we are. Uh, just beside me is, is a rocking chair. And on the rocking chair, probably can't see it, but there's a, there's a, a cover made by my friend and uh, it, it's an embroidery and applique with uh, all the different leaves and the different seasons. Um, so uh, she made it for me as a birthday present and in the middle of it, uh, you may be interested to know, is the yin and yang sign, uh, which uh, you know is, is, is a wonderful goal to try and aim for. I don't always get there, uh, but in any case, my, my wee chapter, and thank you everybody most warmly and sincerely for, uh, for in asking me to contribute and for your beautiful uh, comradeship 
uh, while we we did the project. So basically, uh, I'm I'm taking different examples of how madness and environment uh, are, are are kind of represented or represent different sorts of things in Irish literature. And uh, most of you will be familiar with Yeats, of course. Uh, and I'm really looking at Yeats as a kind of pastoralist um, whose view of land is really to see it as landscape or uh, amenity. But within that, of course, uh, it, it's complicated because he has a number of mad figures uh, like Crazy Jane. And these are really representatives. They're kind of revenantal figures. Uh, and really for, for Yeats, they, they kind of stand for uh, a, an Ireland that he thinks is gone, whether it ever existed, of course, a whole different matter. Um, but it, it, it's really, they're really uh, antidotes to what he sees as uh, the, the gum bean men, the, the middle class Catholic Irish coming to power. So there's, there's you know, a subtext there uh, that is, as somebody said, thinly revealed. Uh, so uh, Carlton, on the other hand, is a, a person who grew up in the land, not very far from where I am here, maybe 15 miles or so, uh, a very lush uh, uh, rolling hills, you might say, um, Scott, uh, where I am here, it's actually a flood plain, so quite liable to, to be under water, the fields near the river. Uh, so Carlton uh, was grew up in the rural area. He he wasn't a city person, but he moved to the city like so many co country people, and he invents figures like Raymond Mahaha, Raymond of the Huts, and Raymond uh, represents uh, is a mad figure, or we might say now intellectually challenged. But uh, as across all world literatures, you have, if you like, the figure of the holy fool, a somewhat shamanic but bereft of shamanic power. And really his function is Coric, uh, C-H-O-R-I-C. Uh, and he's there to talk about the condition of Ireland. So this mad figure is in the landscape, which is being um, wrecked uh, in a most catastrophic way by famine. So he's talking about what's called the Great Famine. Uh, ben, your father may know what I'm talking about here, um, and and that uh, you know devastated the the population, and many people ended up Scott in America uh, on the coffin ships as a result of that famine. Um, and um, the third figure that I I speak about is the poet Seamus Heaney, who again grew up in the country not too far from me here, maybe 20, 30 miles. And he uh, then took a very famous text called Bulya Shivna or the Madness of Sweeney, which was a ninth century oral text. My colleagues in India and other places, and of course uh, in Greece will be very familiar with oral poetry and, uh, and how fantastic it is. So we owe so much to Homer um, and all the boys. Uh, so, so what uh, Bulyshevna was originally an oral poem, and then written down after Christianity. But it tells of a figure who defies the the new order, and the new order, of course, is Christianity, and he belongs to the Druidic order. And uh, it's a very interesting, uh, uh, you know, because we tend in the West, people tend to think of Christianity as the hegemony. Uh, uh, but of course, uh, it was not always this. Uh, so it's got a lot to show us about our own world. But in terms of environment, um, what we have is this half man, half bird figure. Again, something that appears in the literature quite a lot, the, these hybrid forms. Um, and he, he, he uh, goes all over. He's been driven mad uh, and a curse put upon him by a cleric, a saint. Um, and he flits all over Ireland. And of course, what we get is both nature as incredibly hostile uh, and barren. It's lovely of you, Scott, to say such nice things about us. But if you're here in the middle of December uh, uh, in the mountains, you mightn't find it so congenial. So it's a very bare landscape at times. Uh, but he also has these oases or plenum 
which of course you get in American literature in, in Cormac McCarthy's The Road and novels like that, where uh, all the mad men meet in Glen Balkan. So it, it suggests some very interesting uh, conceptualizations of madness. Uh, and the three authors uh, deal with it, each of them in different ways. Um, but as literary people, they're, they're you know, quite interested in what, what madness is a metaphor. But in Heaney, you do get representations of madness that are quite close to, to certain kinds of manic states. Uh, so, you know, it's a, a little bit different from a medical point of view. So I, I'm not going to take up any more time. I'm very, very happy to comment or take questions later, but I'm just aware that there are a lot of people who want to speak. So thank you so much uh, for your time. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Tess. And you see from the movement from the, the flesh of the world in, in Nicoletta's approach to our discussions of madness and environment in Tess's, the wide range of approaches that people have adopted for this project. Let's move next to John Charles Ryan and um, Aboriginal writing in Australia. Great, thank you, Scott. And thank you, uh, Vidya and Swarna for um, expertly editing this volume and for the vision involved in bringing the two fields together, uh, the medical and the environmental humanities. So I, I have to reflect on, on when I first received the invitation, which was during uh, COVID. And in fact, I went to Surabaya, Indonesia in March, 2020 and uh, Due to COVID, uh, compounded with some of my own medical issues, I needed to stay almost two years in Indonesia, uh, unable to fly uh, back home. Uh, so it's a poignant recollection uh, to think of that moment. And uh, I, well, I first want to comment on the idea of the medical environmental humanities. I. I wrote a review recently of emerging topics in the environmental humanities, and it was uh, almost boundless. There are at least 12 to 15 uh, areas that I identified, including the paleo environmental humanities, the plant humanities, right? And so as I see it, the challenge uh, for scholars in this area is to find ways to bridge these emerging areas, to find threads that connect them so that we, we don't end up with uh, disciplinary like silos in transdisciplinary areas, right? So the medical environmental humanities to me represents a, a way of uh, merging, of, pro of promoting dialogue between two interdisciplinary areas towards a transdisciplinarity of environmental scholarship, right? So, um, so Thank you so much for the opportunity to contribute. Now, uh, the chapter that I wrote developed the idea of literary ethnobotany, which is uh, a term I've been uh, theorizing to show how works of literature intersect with ethnobotanical knowledge. Ethnobotany has typically been located in the fields of anthropology, and botany, so bringing science and social science into dialogue. And the field has a more than 100 year history. Uh, but the idea of literary ethnobotany brings literature into dialogue uh, with ethnobotany and thus with social science and botanical science. So literary ethnobotany, the power of narratives to convey the importance of plants uh, from uh, to uh, traditional in traditional worldviews, uh, but also the modern importance of plants in many ways as food, fibers, medicines, ornamentation, and so forth. But also plants as uh, subjects of human health and well-being, mediators or agents of human health and well-being. And if we look at that in an indigenous Australian context, it's the idea of the plant as kin, as a dreaming ancestor, as a persona uh, with the capacity for memory, for intelligence, for behavior, for communication, right? And so 
uh, the chapter I wrote applies this literary ethno ethnobotany framework to uh, reading a selection of poems by uh, Utru Nunukal and Lionel Fogarty. Now, Utru Nunukal is the first uh, Aboriginal author to publish a volume of poetry uh, called We Are Going in 1964. And so she was a pioneer in Aboriginal literature, but also in environmental activism. She brought those two together powerfully in the same way that Judith Wright brought poetry and, and environmental activism into uh, dialogue uh, in, in the Anglo-European Australian tradition. So Utru Nunakau and Lionel Fogarty is uh, a contemporary poet. Uh, you might describe his work as almost experimental, but uh, I believe that what's most important about reading Lyle, Lionel Fogarty's work is to understand the ways in which it brings a uh, traditional uh, indigenous knowledge to contemporary literary practice in Australia. Uh, so two poets, uh, and um, the another idea developed in this analysis is human plant intercorporeality. So the ways in which the bodies of plants and the bodies of people and other beings are uh, interwoven, interrelated over time, not only in the utilitarian way of eating plants and uh, consuming plants, but also how our the health of our bodies is intertwined. And so their poetry discloses these uh, relationalities between plants and people um, from traditional indigenous Australian worldviews. And I just in closing, I'd like to read a passage from uh, from this book, Story About Feeling, uh, Bill Nietzsche, the uh, incredible uh, uh, poet from the north of Australia, from the Kakadu area of, of uh, the Northern Territory outside Darwin. A story about feeling is a remarkable book that traces his uh, knowledge of ancestral relations between people and the more than human world. And I'd just like to read a passage from the first section of the book, and it's called Laying Down. I love a tree because he love me too, he watching me same as you, tree he working with your body, my body working with us while you sleep you working daylight you walking around you work too that tree grass that all like our father dirt earth i sleep with this earth grass just like your brother in my blood in my arm this grass this dirt for us because we'll be dead we'll be going this earth this is the story now. Stone, you never move. Rock, you don't move around. You got to stay forever and ever. You'll be there, million, million star, because he stay, he never move. Tree, he follow, you and me. You'll be dead behind us, but next one you'll come. Same people, Aborigines, same. We'll be dead, but next one, kid, you'll be born, same, this tree, star. You'll stay forever and ever. When you laying down in the night, look at that star. I was, I look star. I remember back when I was young. So I highly recommend uh, getting a copy of story about feeling. Uh, so thank you very, very much for the opportunity to speak about it. Uh, thank you so much, John. Uh, uh, that was really a powerful way to conclude your remarks with that reading. Um, can I pause for a second and say, Victor, one of our contributors, Mita Banerjee, has written and said that she's trying to enter the room, but it's been blocked. I wonder if you can allow her in without uh, allowing lots of other um, less relevant people into the discussion. Um, so, uh, and John, were you, are you joining us from New Jersey? Yes, days? I am. Yes, yeah. New Jersey. <laughs> Good. Well, let's let's move from John in New Jersey to Jaru Chang, who's right next door in New York, and also one of the contributors to the book. Jaru. God, Swana Nvidia. I finally need to see Swana Nvidia uh, in person and uh, virtually, anyway. Um, 
Well, and thanks to uh, bringing me on board. Uh, I just want to, well, start with this. Um, I think when I wrote this article, it was during uh, during COVID or probably just the COVID restart, uh, just begins or, um, I, this is a very different piece that I, different from the ones I did before, because it focused more on the identity politics that happened during COVID-19. Um, as an eco-scholar, I, I don't particular label myself as either material eco-critic or, you know, this or that. So it's really hard to identify who I actually am. But I guess what I am really interested in is to, I, I guess I'll, I can call it now the in aspect of eco criticism in a sense that I, I, I like to identify some of the invisible or, or uh, problems that we encounter during crisis or climate you know, change crisis or other crisis, or, um, or to identify unlikely allies. So, so, so here, the one of the, the very interesting allies I find is a French literary critic and anthropologist, Hene Jiha's uh, mimetic theory. And in helping us to think up, think about health or dis disease or pathology in a in time of cultural crisis or biological crisis or uh, pandemic in this case. Um, uh, so during the, during COVID nineteen, I observe a widespread behavior. Uh, somebody already gave it a name. It's mimetic pathology. So in a sense that you know you see people uh, grabbing toilet paper right in the supermarket. So one person did something, and the whole you started the whole uh, herd mentality, right? So it, it it actually reveals something very interesting about human nature. During crisis, we start to mimic other people's behavior, and it had it can have a very destructive uh, for become a very destructive in society. And the other very interesting thing that observed by Hene Jiha is the scapegoating, uh, 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 you know, problem that you start to see people start to name calling the cultural other, right? Uh, in you know China, or you see Donald Trump actually scapegoating China, or you know, or people, the, the other people uh, scapegoating the Asian minorities, or um, so I see that cultural problem. So in this sense, that um, you can see cultural, biological, or ecological uh, issues or a, a crisis start to converge. You know, um, so so basically, the this uh, pathology is a form of anxiety about the other, you know, and and um, and some of the people that the mimeticist has already some provided some solution. If like Jihad said that uh, mimet if mimetic is human nature, we can't change our you know we have this mimetic genes or something in our brain. And imitation is just the way we learn and we build society and civilization. Then we just come up with a good models, right? You know, we emulate the people's good behavior and then try to eliminate bad behavior. Okay. And in this uh, article, I try to argue the alternative. I try to I try to provide. I think this is still a dualistic model that that uh, we imagine our society in a secular, in a, what Charles Taylor says, in a, a secular age, you know, that accepting our secular, uh, secular sort of um, uh, reality, you know, uh, without possibility of thinking beyond. Uh, uh, so it, it, uh, along with what I was saying, I was trying to think about the invisible, uh, the, the un unlikely allies to find a way you know, to get out of this mimetic pathology or violence, uh, I propose to turn to Buddhism and the Zen meditation, and particularly koan. Uh, koan is is a puzzle like paradox, like what is the sound of one hand clapping? 
it actually will help us get beyond dualistic mimetic thinking, thinking about we have no other choice, but we do have other choice, you know, this kind of subject object division is the is the outcome is the product of our discursive mind. And that's why we can talk endlessly about environmental problems, learning all the new theories. We can just keep producing more anthologies and more conferences, more and perpetuating, perpetuating the, the current way of doing, doing eco-criticism. And the environment will get worse and worse, and it's not helping because we are not operating on a non-dualistic model. And this is the paradox that I think Scott in your yesterday's uh, talk was talking about. That is the Zen koan, that is the koan, you know. At some point, our mind just gets numb with all the th theories, I just can't imagine any PhD students nowadays, how many theories, theories in, they have to digest in order to save the planet, right? And we just at the level of talking, right? And our consciousness has not changed. It just, just get more confused, you know? So, so our unlikely ally here, and we really need to look out of eco current eco-criticism framework to look for other possible unthinkable, you know, like who is that? The, the, I think it's Deleuze, the, the, uh, the impossible allies or something like that. I forgot the term. Uh, so here, I think Cohen's way of thinking, what is the sound of one hand clapping, for example? The unthinkable actually help us to get out of that, mo that model of, of discursive mind, where we can actually realize that the, uh, the can truly have a firsthand, uh, firsthand experience of that ecological selves that people, everybody is talking about, but have no idea what that is, you know. Um, so, so, so basically this is, and I use, um, in this article, I use one of the most famous koans, uh, it's called the Nansan Kills the Cat. Um, so basically the story is about a Zen monk seeing two sides of the manga fighting over a cat. The cat is the object of desire. So two sides of mimetic parties are fighting over the object of desire, right? And the nun suddenly holds up the cat and saying, if nobody can give me, show me the the, the mind that goes beyond this kind of mimetic uh, uh, competition, then I'm gonna kill this cat, you know? And in the end, nobody answered it. So he has to kill the cat. And his uh, disciple, one of his most disciples came back and nun -san told him the whole event and he put his shoes and walked out of the room. Okay, so you might take this kind of Zen humor and laugh about it, but you really, we did but that he is making, he is showing a direction there. And in order to understand that we need to enter the altered state of consciousness in order to see, in order to see what that gesture means. So my tentative, I'm going to conclude very quickly. My tentative conclusion is just if we want to find a, a way out of our current dilemma, we have to find another, a deeper layer of consciousness in order to find the answer. And this is a collective project that we have to do it. Whether it's in the name of Buddhism, I don't care. It's, it's just that my method dualistic thinking is not working. All right, thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Jaru. And, and uh, I also wanted to mention, I'm aware of the time. I realize we're at the hour now, but we did get a delayed start. I want to allow each of the contributors to say a few minutes worth about your projects, but let's try to, to keep these very concise so that everyone will have a chance and maybe just a few minutes for a wrap up at the end. Meanwhile, in the chat, we're trying to let some more people in, contributors who were locked out. Uh, made it. They made it into the book, but they couldn't make it into the launch. Uh, so we're doing our best to navigate that process. Um, so um, next on my screen, I, I have uh, Gizem Ilmaz Karahan. And Gizem, could you tell us a little bit about your chapter? 
Yeah, first of all, it's, it's a privilege to be a part of this super looking book, actually. The, the cover is great and, you know, the content is great. Thank you so much, Swarna, Vidya and Scott for including me in this uh, perfect project. Uh, basically, I will try to keep it short because of the time limit. Basically, I talk about how um, these kinds of pandemics, but in the old times, it's epidemic. They are like, you know, forming a kind of storied matter. So I use uh, this term coined by Serena Leovino and Sarpi Loperman. And I look at the, you know, literary examples of how um, these epidemics are reflected in, in history, starting with a Sumerian epic, uh, whose title is Atrahasis, and you know, I look at how um, epidemics are represented in, in those kinds of time, and then the Cameron, and then Iliad, and then Mary Shelley is the last man, uh, and I also have uh, a play, I guess, Renes from Renaissance period uh, by John Webster. And then I look at the historical examples of you know how how some some civilizations got lost because of these epidemics, uh, because of some invasions, and they didn't know some you know they, they, their uh, bodies weren't familiar with the new microbes and viruses that came with the invaders. So um, based on these observations. Well, it's really hard to be you know in a hurry because I try to wrap it up all uh, quickly, but. Uh, uh, based on these observations, I, I try to show that uh, all these epidemics are actually uh, talking to us because they carry something from history. And those um, echoes of historical uh, stories are inside our bodies because it's encoded in our DNA, which functions as our cosmic scribe indeed. So from a very post-humanist and materially co-critical perspective, I analyze this text and you know how some civilizations got lost in history. And I also look at the travels of Evliya Celebi, who is a very famous Ottoman traveler, and how you know some cities in Turkey uh, are, you know, even the names of the cities or some city icons are influenced by the epidemics, actually, how the names are coming from uh, the epidemics. Uh, and I uh, very briefly mentioned the medical discourse by looking at how, you know, elemental and sensory uh, agencies are actually interacted. Uh, and that sits, uh, and then I conclude by saying that these epidemics actually tell us a lot because they are storied matters. So we should start listening to these uh, non-human stories, actually. Uh, thank you again for this, you know, uh, chance to be a part of this project. And uh, it's so nice to see uh, familiar and new faces here. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Gizem. Um, and I, I see we now have Mita Banerjee and Eric Morel have joined us. And in the in a separate email, um, Francoise Besson from France has asked if she can join. So I, I'm trying to carry on this uh, correspondence on the side as I listen to everybody speak. Um, so we got a slightly late start, uh, Mita and Eric. And um, we're trying to allow everyone to say a few words about their chapters. And, and we're right in the midst of this process. Next on my screen, I have Ani Meshroy. And um, uh, Gizem, you, you're in Turkey, I assume, right? Somewhere in Turkey? Hey. Yeah, yeah, Ankara in Turkey, the, the capital, Ankara. So. In Ankara, welcome. Yeah. And uh, Ani Mesh, where are you calling us from? Uh, thanks, Scott. Uh, I'm calling from Calcutta, the eastern part of uh, India. Okay. Wonderful. So I, Wonderful. Yeah, so I work yeah, in a please. college almost 50 miles away from Calcutta. Okay. <laughs> Wonderful. Please, please tell us a little bit about your project. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Scott. Uh, th thanks, uh, Vidya. Thanks, uh, Swarna. It's a wonderful experience to work for in this volume. I, thanks, you know, to Bloomsbury to, for making this book, you know, possible. I still remember, you know, when I got the chance to, you know, write for this book. Uh, it was the middle of the pandemic, and I just got a call, you know, to you know send you know write paper for this. Now, uh, as far as this uh, uh, this intersection of medical humanities and environmental humanities is concerned, I was you know initially thinking about these for around 2015, but I you know couldn't start anything, and it goes back to my personal experience in 2015 when my PhD was at the you know last stage. You know, one of the doctors, I was misdiagnosed at that point of time, you know. And then when I went for a second opinion to a doctor, he, you know, turned down that diagnosis. And the reason behind that 
was that he told that no it's uh, it's rubbish it's uh, because this disease is a caucasian disease it can't happen in the tropical places and then i you know that was one of those foundational ideas that diseases are not just you know somatic this is a diseases are not just genetic it has a, a lot to do about the environment it has a lot to do the equal you know the ecology you inhabit the kind of foods that you eat you know so uh, in a way uh, that was the you know uh, uh, springboard for successive thought for me you know how to you know bridge this medical humanities and this uh, environmental humanities to you know and bring them into a dialogue with each other and then when i went to teach in a college which is basically uh, populated mostly by the indigenous people i saw their pharmacopoeia and what i saw is that they are not entirely at all dependent on the western form of medicine the post enlightenment western form of medicine you know we understand you know how uh, how the entire botanical you know life forms has been uh, redesigned by carolus linnaeus you know uh, accordingly but they have their own way of looking at things you know into medicine they have their own pharmacopoeia and then we i found out that you know uh, you know the way they understand disease the way they understand health is not just simply kin- clinical but eco cultural it has a lot to do with their ecology it has a lot to do with their culture and that was the you know uh, you know the foundation of my argument and the chapter that i wrote from the clinical to the eco cultural is not a basically my argument is not to subvert you know or to take away the uh, the achievements of the western medicine but just to complement you know uh, uh, the arguments of uh, western medicine and to uh, look for alternative ways of looking at uh, an understanding of diseases and health and hygiene you know uh, at this point of time and to see how you know those ideas uh, are reflected in literature and culture so this is what i've tried to uh, make a point uh, in my chapter and thanks for uh, making this possible because without this opportunity this idea you know couldn't have been fruitful thanks a lot god thanks a thank lot vidya and thanks a lot soarna thank you very much animesh for that quick summary of your project and many of the chapters in the book really focus on on special or specific cultural perspectives cultural um angles on this interconnection between the natural environment and and human health just as ani mesh was explaining another example of this would be in qy chu's article on traditional chinese medicine and qy maybe you could tell us briefly about that hi hi thanks a lot uh, adding my thanks to uh, everybody's uh, to scott and uh, swana and vijaya so i'm qy and i'm um, i'm i teach in uh, nana technological university in singapore but i'm now uh, currently based in north carolina as a as a fellow at the uh, national humanity center so it's um, on, on the eastern um, time as well so my my paper uh yeah like uh, scott's mentioned it focuses actually on um on chinese herbs chinese uh, traditional chinese medicines and uh as a film scholar i try to focus also uh, on uh, documentaries and and visual texts that are related to herbal medicine in in um in my paper so um the paper generally it's about how um i i'm i'm seeing a an a, a growth of a, a lot of these representations of uh chinese medicines in in films and and other kinds of media texts uh but then uh my my paper tries to talk about how um they at at at, at some at, at, um uh on 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 one hand they try to uh help us to rethink and redefine uh, environmental uh, medicines from uh, eco philosophical and uh, multi species perspectives but at the same time they also kind of re, uh, re um, affirm a lot of these um tri- um uh, uh, social stigmas and and stereotypes that we have uh, towards uh, uh chinese medicine so um i in my paper i try to talk about how um they uh these documentaries um they they do let us know more about how uh chinese medicines are uh, as a kind of um um uh, uh, presents themselves as a, as a um as a kind of um medicine that that um that uh, shows us a world of multi species coexistence and also uh, is guided through a lot of these traditional chinese thoughts but at the same time they also um 
uh, we assert the kind of um, social stigmas that it is a kind of uh, ancient and mythical um, uh, medicine that is um, rather different from like scientific uh, modern um, uh, medicines. So um, in in the paper, I tried to talk about how how um, the docu uh, documentaries and, and these uh, media texts are failing to uh, address a lot of these ideological um, clashes that we see in uh, that, that we can see in Chinese medicines, uh, particularly in, in terms of the um, philosophical um, perspectives and, and also um, the, the, the more contemporary um, uh, ideological uh, ideas like um, animal justice and um, uh, wildlife conservation, etc. Because a lot of these medicines and, and these herbs are actually made of, uh, in addition to plants, uh, also animals. But then uh, this is also one of the controversy that we see in uh, uh, Chinese medicines that uh, people in the world are criticizing uh, often. But uh, at the same time, um, something that could be addressed in a lot of these documentaries, but they seem to be missing the, the, the chance. So um, it's, it's, a, it's a general paper on, on uh, and, and also uh, my, my first attempt to uh, expand from environmental humanities to the medical field. So I think it's a, it's, uh, I would try to do more on, on this uh, in, 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 the, in, in the coming uh, future as well, but I'll, I'll, I'll stop here and, and give the time to everybody else. Thank you, QY. Thank you. And I, I would say what you, what you mentioned is probably true for many of us. It's our first foray from, from the environmental perspective into the medical, and for some people, maybe from the medical in the direction of the environmental. So a lot of us are, are uh, moving in unfamiliar but welcome directions. Thank you very much. Also in that uh, final section of the book devoted to particular cultural perspectives, uh, Daria Argis, Argis um, uh, represents traditional Turkish um, folk music. And Daria, could you tell us a little bit about your chapter? Uh, of course, I divided several plants and animals found in some lyrics, classical Turkish song lyrics. Then I investigated the ecolinguistic metaphors existent in these songs. These songs were in the public domain, of course. And I tried to discover several ecolinguistic metaphors in them that consist of mental structures, thus mental frames, that may assist humans uh, get cured, get healed from different mental or emotional problems as macams, therefore compositional styles were used to heal different mental, mentally ill patients in the Ottoman Empire. Um, for instance, these plants and uh, animals Re uh, led to the recovery of many uh, patients in the past. And I investigated this through an experiment with several online students. Then what I found was that there were several mental metaphors, therefore frames consistent, hidden under these sentences, such as nature is a shelter or negative ideas, feelings are viruses or earthquakes. Lyrics are medicine or strong shelters against disasters. Nature is a container for emotions and health. Indifference is an earthquake. Nature destruction is a virus. Then the students also told that several lyrics led to them feel happier. For instance, when we think about the lyrics of some songs, there seem to several metaphors that provoke happiness, such as roses are the loud ones and thorns are insignificant defects. Spring is hope. And I compared the lyrics with some idioms and proverbs in the Turkish language, such as gül gibi bakmak, to look after somebody as if she were a rose. Then also, this study showed that all idioms, proverbs, and lyrics had healing effects being based on natural elements. And when interpreted, 
they create satirical effects that make people laugh and they make people feel happier, as I discovered in this study. Thank, thank you very much, Daria. Yeah, and yeah. now let's see. I, I, we've had a few people who are able to join us a little bit later in the call, are contributors to the book. And I'd like to give you each a chance to say something very briefly about your chapters. The book actually begins with a few chapters devoted to different aspects of narrative medicine and um, the environmental humanities. And um, I wonder, uh, Mita, since I think you were the first to, to be able to rejoin us a little bit later, maybe Mita Banerjee, you could tell us about your chapter. And are you calling in from Germany? Yes, yes. And I'm, I'm very excited and, and also as, as my fellow speakers, uh, I'm really, really grateful to, to you and Vija and Swarna uh, for having me because actually in Germany, you know, narrative medicine, I mean, environmental humanities, there's a lot of scholars who are working on it, but medical humanities has been slower to sort of pick up. Um, and my own work has been, um, as you said, in the field of narrative medicine. And I was wondering in this chapter, I, I had sort of, um, the point I wanted to make was, uh, to speak about water as a human right, uh, which is increasingly becoming debated because water has been privatized and uh, access to water, you know, has been, you know, um, unevenly distributed, especially for ethnic minorities in different nation states. And I was wondering, uh, in the chapter, I tried to say, what if we look at these questions not as a um, simply as an environmental issue? but also as a question of human rights and medical rights. What if we read these human rights infringements as a medical narrative and how would it sort of generate empathy then, uh, you know, in different settings? Um, and so I try to, uh, you know, as all the other, or some of the other contributors, I try to look at cultural texts that represent access to water, uneven access to water. And I looked at one science fiction series, uh, Goliath, which actually, uh, was very much a you know white middle class uh, sort of thriller about white people being barred from accessing clean water, which I thought was actually cynical. You know, if you look at the way this actually actually plays out in in, in sort of real life, um, where actually you know it's ethnic minorities, it's working class communities that don't have access to uh, clean water. So then I looked at the water scandal of Flint, Michigan. Uh, where predominantly African American, you know, community have been, you know, um, impaired actually by a lack of access to water. And I looked at Hannah Mona Atisha's uh, account, which is her as a as a pediatrician, saying, you know, she saw that her children, you know, the children that she cared for were getting sick. And I thought, what if we look at this from a narrative medicine angle? Uh, and then how would she, as a pediatrician, also work with these communities in giving a voice to those who you know have had severe sort of health um, risks because of this water um, and for me that's something I'm still and this is where I'm resonating with uh, you know I think a lot of uh, people in the book you know how do we talk about human rights issues and um, environmental issues uh, with regard to you know communities of color essentially uh, so I was actually thrilled to you know, hear all the other contributions, especially, especially also Eric's, um, you know, reading Eric's, uh, who is also concerned with um, narrative medicine. So thanks so much. Thank you very much, Mita. And that's a perfect segue to Eric Morell, who's with us now as well. And Eric, maybe you can tell us a little bit about your chapter. And you're currently on the East Coast of the US. Is that right? Uh I'm actually joining you from near Gig Harbor, Washington. I'm, I'm academically situated at the University of Delaware, but I am um, currently on the West Coast. For oh, family wonderful. Well, yeah, please um, tell us a little bit about your chapter, which I think ties in well with Mita's chapter with, that she just presented. It does. It was um, great to hear about that chapter, Mita. Um, so my, my chapter does, it sort of takes a broad approach. It doesn't study a very specific problem, but I was trying to um, think about reading that I've done in narrative medicine as an eco narratologist and I'm um, thinking about that in uh, applying narrative medicine to um, situations involving uh, interfaces between the, the public and environmental science. And so um, for me, one of those interfaces that I'm interested in is citizen science. 
um, where a lot of the time volunteers are recruited to gather data, but are um, unevenly asked to sort of provide narrative accounts of how they've um, collected that data or um, you know, how their engagement in the program in particular. And so part of what I'm uh, arguing in my chapter is that um, by paying attention to those stories and using some of the practices involved in narrative medicine, um, especially having to do with parallel charting and, um, you know, then sort of close reading those stories, um, ultimately we could sort of devise some research strategies for looking at narrative knowledge that's produced in the citizen science enterprise. Um, and so, and then the sort of I like to have traffic in both directions. So then I was also suggesting that the environmental humanities have um, a sort of return application for the medical humanities by thinking about a lot of the themes that come up with sort of ecology and environmental issues that can um, uh, help other discussions such as those of illness and death that we find so often in um, medical humanities. And so my examples in the chapter are just related to different um, citizen science blogs. I didn't have a lot of chances to interview participants of citizen science myself at this stage, but um, I was trying to read through kind of blogs about participants and their narratives to show how we could sort of draw similar themes and um, applications. So uh, thank you all um, to the editors and uh, my apologies for rejoining the meeting a little bit late, but this has been great. No problem at all. Thank you, Eric. And I think what we hear in Eric's uh, presentation is this notion of inventing new methodologies uh, by combining disciplines and, and also by working with new media, such as blogs from citizen scientists, the kind of material that we wouldn't normally um, all be accustomed to analyzing in a scholarly way. So uh, that's one of the things that we've attempted to represent in the book, some not just traditional methodologies applied to new subject matter, but actually the, the coining or the fabrication of new approaches that comes from joining together different systems of thought. And, and Eric, as you described your project, that was certainly at work in your chapter. And I believe the only the, the last remaining person who hasn't had a chance to briefly summarize uh, the chapter in the book is Francoise Besson, who's joining us from Toulouse, France. And Francoise, hello. Uh, good, e good evening. Um, maybe, maybe you could just say a brief word about what you did in your chapter as we've been going around the room and you can help us wrap up this process. Um, so perhaps you could say a few words about your chapter. And sorry for, for being late and thank you to, to you and Sona and Vidya for inviting me for this uh, project. Well, uh, in my chapter, I have tried to, to show the, the, the possibility for literature to help medicine uh, through the connection seen between the human body and the body of nature, as it appears in uh, two novels, particularly in French novelist Albert Camus, La Peste, The Plague, and in American novelist Tony Hillman's The First Eagle. And uh, I have tried to show how the, the spreading of the virus in Camus's novel sounds like a warning. The spreading of the virus starts from an Algerian city characterized by the absence of nature. And in Tony Hillsman's novel taking place in the Navajo reservation, the spreading of a disease in humans comes from the contamination of nature. And this emphasizes the unawareness uh, that caused that uh, spreading, the devastation of the land, the human and non-human diseases, and the criminal plot interweave and reflect one another to denounce the damage done on uh, Navajo uh, people and on the Navajo land by the exploitation of uranium mines. And this echoes, in fact, a sad reality uh, since uh, articles mention that the 683 abandoned uranium mines uh, are still there in, on the Navajo reservation. And some researchers also made the link uh, in Australia, particularly between a virus spreading among horses and humans and the disappearance of trees. And a, a virologist, uh, Raina Plowright, said that many studies have made the link between deforestation and the transmission of viruses. And once again, it is in this awareness of connections between the earth and human and non-human bodies that solution can help and stop the uh, spreading of diseases. And by taking the example of those two novels, I have tried to show how um, literature can denounce contaminations of lands generating human diseases by spreading words to make people aware of facts that are often unknown from the general public. 
and thus they try to prevent the repetition of such contaminations. And uh, I asked myself the question uh, in this chapter whether the spreading of words can stop in a way the spreading of diseases and appear at least as a hope. <clears throat> Sorry. This hope can dwell on the awareness of the connection between the human body and the earth, which appears in some alternative medicines. This is what I have tried to show at the end of this uh, chapter. And literature can help us to realize that Western medicine and traditional medicine, including Chinese medicine, phytotherapy, homeopathy, aromatherapy, etc., are not opposed, but complementary. Uh, for example, in Hillman's novel, um, uh, this novel speaks about uh, healing plants which have been used by Native Americans for centuries. And some physicians using Western medicine sometimes add homeopathy or essential oils or use honey to help and heal patients. So hope can appear in that spreading of medical practices, uniting all forms of medicine instead of opposing them, uh, as it may appear in some, uh, some novels and some fiction novels, some fiction books. And another hope dwells on the use, and this is the last part of my chapter, on the use of literature in medicine faculties as it is as it appears in some American faculties. And literature seems to help medical practice insofar as it adds a psychological and humanist uh, approach that can complete the technical, <coughs> sorry, the technical one and help doctors to understand patients and patients to change their point of view and face medicine with less apprehension. And what this chapter tries to show is that what the humanities suggest is that there is not one protection against any kind of serious disease caused by any form of contamination, bodies contaminated by a virus or lands contaminated by pollution are united. The protection is multiple. It is medical in its treatment of the disease and in the research uh, of protections against it. It is political and economic in the decisions made by governments to decide to change the model or to go on. And it is individual insofar as any change must begin in oneself in the awareness of a system of connections linking us with the earth, with nature and with all its elements, which can either poison us or save us. And text can help people to question themselves and thus work together to heal people and be healed. This is what my chapter is about. Thank you very much, Francoise, and thanks to all of you for your excellent summaries of your chapters. And I realize that some people are kind of peeling away as they run out of time to be with us. We've gone a bit over time because of our delayed beginning. Um, we began this conversation by hearing about how um, this project began during a pandemic. It was initiated to some extent by our awareness of the growing public health jeopardy that we're facing around the world. It seems appropriate that our final presenter should also be talking about her chapter devoted to contemplation of viruses and culture and various forms of, of uh, healing from different um, uh, ethnographic and um, cultural perspectives attempting to, to um, respond to health crises. Um, I should acknowledge the obvious and say that although we began in the pandemic thinking that we would be well past this, um, you know, uh, nearly three years later, we continue to struggle with an ongoing public health crisis and potentially facing a resurgence of different COVID variants this winter. And so it's this awareness, this sensitivity to our own vulnerability, as well as to the fragility of the the planet that sustains us continues to be at the forefront of our minds. And this effort to bring together the environmental and the medical humanities is a project that you would have thought people might have initiated much earlier. It's, it seems so plain that we need to be doing this. I think this book represents a very early effort to work in this direction. And I imagine that many of you are now imagining um, future projects that you'll do along these same lines or ways to encourage our colleagues to think about the intersection between these fields. So thank you for joining this, this uh, virtual launch. Uh, Vidya is uh, messaging me in the chat asking if people would mind turning on their cameras if possible so that we could take a, a screenshot or a picture somehow of the group um, actually being uh, present um, together. And this, this includes, I think, people who are joining us who may not have written for the book, but who are, are present at least at the launch. Um, Vidya, were you going to capture this somehow? Take a screenshot or something? Um, I think maybe we have 
now the cameras alive that are going to become alive. Yeah, um, so I, I'm going to get a screenshot uh, of all of us. So, so there you go. Yeah, hi. Oh, good. Very good. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Just well, I don't. What? One. What video? Yeah. Okay. Thanks. So. Thank, thanks again to all of you for joining us for this virtual launch and for your ideas and your wonderful contributions to this book. It's been a pleasure working with you and and um, I, I wish you all a, a good day and a good evening and and um, I hope that we can connect together on future projects. Thanks. Thanks again. Thank you, thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye.